if I have to read the word ochre one more time. Jesus f Hey, it's him here to talk about The Dead Romantics by Ashley Poston. I went to the library in search of a couple of other books on my want to read list and those books weren't there but this one was. So I'm trying not to let like some kind of version of disappointment color my my feelings about this book like that I was disappointed it wasn't one of these other books that I wanted to read um, but I did want to read this one and I was glad when I found it so there's that my youngest has my copy of Dune Messiah right now so I am waiting for him to finish that before I continue it and I was looking for other things to read in the meantime this was one of them Okay, so <laughs> this book, when I put it on my, my want to read list, I can't even remember where I heard about this book. I remember though that once I had heard kind of something about it, I avoided any other information. And now I can't remember what it is about this book that made me want to read it because I had it in my head that it was some kind of like LGBTQ book. And there is representation in this book, but the main uh, relationship is heterosexual. So I either had the wrong idea or maybe just even the wrong book. Like maybe I, you know, who knows? Again, trying not to let like disappointment color my feelings about this book. Um, I picked it up knowing very little about it and now I've read it so I guess it says something that I did actually read all the way to the end this is I believe yet another Raylo fanfic that has been adapted into mainstream publishing this seems to be the trend right now and you if you see my Hurricane Wars video you know that I like Raylo and I was hoping to find some Raylo books that I could enjoy. The Hurricane Wars was not it. This one was mediocre, I would say. Uh, and uh, oh, I have a lot of thoughts. And it's weird because um, when I talk, it's going to sound like I hated this book. But it's just that there were a lot of little things that distracted me from full enjoyment of this book, if that makes sense. So <laughs> the story is uh, told from the point of view of Florence Day. Um, she is a ghost writer for a romance novelist named Anne Nichols. She has a new editor coming in. She's supposed to be finishing the last book in Anne Nichols's um, contract four book contract. So this is the fourth book she will have written as Ann Nichols, right? Or for Ann Nichols to put her name on. And there's a new editor at the publishing house and she goes in to meet him. And of course she's tiny, like I think she calls herself five foot two and she's wearing Converse and she's got a messy bun because she's been out the whole night before and she doesn't have this book finished because she's decided she hates romance because her last like long-term relationship has fallen apart and so many things and the new editor and this is where this was the first thing I mean of course like tiny little thing big tall guy right big guy mussy dark hair um, and her first thought is that she wants to climb him uh, uh, I hate that kind of thing so but um the, the, the tiny girl, big guy thing, uh, it's got to stop. Never mind that Adam Driver is, yeah, he's what, 6'2", 6'3", and, but Daisy Ridley is like 5'7". She's not tiny. <laughs> like, so, um, no. And the, 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 just the 
onslaught of quirk for this main character, Florence, who always goes by Florence, by the way. She is not Flo or any other kind of nickname. Um, her last boyfriend called her Bunny. But uh, in any case, um, <laughs> the, the big first strike besides all of that was that this editor's name is Benji Andor. If I hadn't well, I mean, I, that's the moment I realized this was a Raylo, right? Like, uh, I don't think I knew it going in. I don't think I picked it up knowing this was a, a Raylo. But, like, that name is a giveaway, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't thrilled with that. It's a little on the nose. Um, she even brings him, like, a cactus as a, like, a, an office warming gift. She bought it like on a whim from someone in the subway I don't know just layers and layers of quirk and she's got this uh, Asian roommate um, who's a fashionista I can't remember what she said Rose's actual job was but and she knows that Rose knows that Florence is on deadline but still insists that they go out and have cocktails and go to this like open mic reading night and uh, it just uh i don't know i don't know all of the contrivances didn't work for me just in the setup this is just the setup because the bulk of the book is that florence runs into the editor again um after kind of arguing with him about whether or not her newest Anne Nichols' book needs to have a happy ending because she just doesn't think romance is a thing anymore and can it be, I don't know, less happy. <laughs> like, I guess she wants to make it more chick lit or, you know, literary fiction than, than romance because obviously, as we all know in publishing, a romance is supposed to have a happily ever after. So uh, he's like, no, um, <laughs> cause that's not what we publish. And that's not what you're contracted to write. So um, Florence goes out with Rose, runs into Benji, Ben, uh, at the dive bar, as well as her ex, Lee, who, as it turns out, stole Florence's life story and wrote a novel that's coming out that's you know getting a huge marketing push and expected to be a bestseller like he you know he got like seven figures for this manuscript it was like at an auction the whole thing and obviously that was what precipitated their breakup and it's been a year which is surprising because the publishing cycle usually is a couple of years although when they get a really hot manuscript they will sometimes push it through very quickly so it's not out of the question that it's only been a year, year and a half till it comes to bookstores, but eh, it's beside the point. Um, she, at this dive bar, you know, she leaves because she can't stand to listen to Lee read an excerpt from his forthcoming book that is her life that he stole, right? And uh, she leaves and she runs into Ben in an alley? I guess behind the bar I don't know and they end up kissing but then she, she gets a phone call and it turns out her father has died and she needs to go home to the small town in I don't know one of the Carolinas that she's from uh, Maremont uh, uh, and then again quirks abound um, this tiny town that Florence has not lived in she, she, she left like a decade ago um, and never came home. Her f family has always come to New York to see her because she refuses to come visit because Florence can see ghosts. Uh, she, de she sees dead people um, and her family business, her dad ran the local funeral home. Apparently it's, you know, I guess been in the family for a while because it's called Days Gone funeral home you know their last name is day ha huh? get it uh and her father could see ghosts and she inherited this ability from him hence the the stuff that the ex stole to turn into some kind of like literary gothic horror novel it sounds like as opposed to 
the happy childhood that Florence actually had. Although Florence, when she was 13, she solved a murder with the help of the ghost of the dead kid. It was a kid who was in her class at school and that's when things started going downhill for her. Um, and people were making fun of her and calling her a liar and all this kind of thing. So, um, that's why once she graduated, she left. Okay, so she goes home to deal with her father's death. She's got, uh, she's the oldest of three. She's got a, a brother, Carver, who is gay and in a, a relationship with someone named Nikki. She's got the youngest is a sister named Alice who is going to take over the funeral home business. She's kind of a rebellious goth emo, like always wears black, you know. And then their mom, who seems basic. I mean, I don't know. I didn't really get a very good sense of the mom's character. She just seemed there. Um, this town has a, a dog for a mayor, and the dog has been mayor for like three terms, which would be like 12 years. This dog must be really old. I don't know. Dogs, you know, they don't live that. I, I assume. I assume it's a four-year term. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's only a two-year term for mayor in this town, but even still. Uh, and yeah, I don't know how any actual work gets done in a town with a dog for a mayor. I, I, I know that this happens. I've seen it, the news stories, oh, they elected a dog, you know, or whatever. But like, how does administration actually take place? Somebody must act, in, you know, for the dog. I, in any case, in any case, the dad, of course, leaves like a bizarre list of requests for his funeral. He wants a thousand wildflowers. He wants a dozen crows and Elvis. Um, and Florence decides to take on that task of getting all the stuff for the, the fun for her dad's funeral because Alice still has to, you know, has other funerals to finish up with, and uh, I don't remember what Carver's doing. He has a job of some kind, ostensibly, I guess. Uh, and yeah, so then the ghost of Ben shows up because it turns out that he has been hit by a car back in New York. And I'm gonna get into some spoilers here, so if you don't want to know more about this book, you stop now and come back after you've read it, but we're gonna get to some spoilers. I already had a lot of these quote-unquote twists clocked pretty early on. The fact that Ben had some kind of relationship to or with Ann Nichols was pretty clear to me. Um, as it turns out, she was his grandmother who raised him because his parents died when he was like 13. Uh, and the fact that Ben wasn't really dead was also very clear to me just, again, early on. In part because I've read enough uh, of these kinds of books to make educated guesses about what the plot really is. But also you know, obviously to have the happily ever after, they have to be together. And you could do ghost and live person, but I don't think that quite fits the bill. And it, it definitely tried to make you believe that that might be where they go with this. But is a ghost that's earthbound truly happy? I guess you could make the argument, well, if they're in a happy relationship with a live person, maybe. But, you know, do they want to hang around and watch their live partner slowly wither? Probably not. That's, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. In any case, it was pretty clear that he wasn't dead anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, just because of all of the little omissions, and maybe it's because I come from a mystery background, but like, uh, it's mentioned that he's hit by a car. It is nobody at any point says that he's actually died. And I'm like, well, people survive getting hit by cars, you know? Um, and, you know, at one point, Florence kind of absent-mindedly tries to Google his obit and doesn't find it. And he mentions, as a ghost, he mentions at different times that he hears voices and noises. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably the doctors. You know, like, it's not, um, it's not rocket science or anything. It's not a huge leap. 
of logic to assume where this was coming from. Uh, in any case, I guess Ben is, I mean, you know, she's, she thinks he's dead and she's trying to figure out why he's there. Um, she assumes it's because she hasn't finished the manuscript and she needs to finish it in order for him to move on because obviously he's that, he's that, uh, like tied to his work, I guess, that he can't die in peace until she finishes. You know, there are probably other books, Florence, he's the editor, but you're not the only person writing a manuscript for him. There are other books. He could have work in the afterlife indefinitely. So, you know, the idea that it's just you and your book is a little... Um, the plot such as it is, is her and Ben spending time together, getting closer, and ostensibly Florence trying to, like, complete this checklist of items that her father left regarding his funeral. But there's very little of that, and what there is of it isn't a substantial... The stakes aren't high. I kept waiting for the stakes to go up, and they just didn't. Um, it was a very, like, flat story, let's say. There is a police officer um, named Saget, who I guess gave Florence a hard time back when she lived in Mermont and was a teenager. They keep referring to her having released a rabid possum into the police station at one point. She's like, I didn't know it was rabid. I didn't think it was rabid. Like, we don't get that whole story. We just get kind of it referred to a few times. But, um, yeah, like, I was waiting for him to pose some kind of bigger threat or problem to Florence's attempts to, you know, get her father's stuff done or whatever, but nah, I guess. Uh, so it wasn't, there was a lot of cute, quirky stuff in this book and not a lot of actual story. And the characters are pretty bland. Like none of them are super interesting. A lot of them seem kind of interchangeable. The dialogue, there's like no amount of dialogue that I, you know, like felt tied to character. Um, like nobody had like a way of speaking where if I had heard a line of dialogue, I could have told you exactly who said it. I mean, I could make a guess. Ben is, is pretty stolid. Um, the banter wasn't funny or cute, really, in my mind. I just, I don't know, I've read so much better. Um, the, the sexy stuff wasn't, I'm not, I'm not the person to ask, but I just didn't think it was that great. Uh, yeah, I don't know, it just, I gave it three stars. I gave it three stars because when I looked at my list of books I've read this year, I. I guess I liked this better than a number of other things. Um, but at the same time, like, I didn't think it was great. I just felt like, I don't know. And look, I come from a fan fiction background. Um, I, there were times when publishers were asking me if there was a way to adapt a game of hearts into something original that could be published. There's not. That is That series of stories is so firmly rooted in BBC Sherlock that I just, there's no way to do that, as cool as that would have been. But I think really good fan fiction is deeply rooted in the characters as they've been established and, the, and you know, the world as it's been established. So I find, at least for me, what I'm finding is that fan fiction that has been taken and uh, twisted and adapted to be original so it can be published is usually not very good because it, it it just it loses the thing or things that made it appealing um ben i guess feels like some version of like i, I don't i don't even know like i'm like i can picture adam driver um, but I can't, um, and I can, I can see some 
kinder, gentler version of Ben, who's like very like kind of uh, restrained and um, you know repressed, I guess. As as this character, I can I I can see kind of a Ray type um, character uh, as Florence. I mean, I don't know if they're meant to be one-to-ones or anything like that. I don't know what the original stuff looked like. But we find out that Florence, of course, is also a big fan fiction author who wrote Lestat, Lestat and X-Files fan fiction that she's hidden in a box under a floorboard in the old funeral home. You know, and look, I I got my start writing fan fiction. I, I in fact... One of my X-Files fan fictions used to have its own, like, fan Wikipedia page, fandom page, <laughs> you know, like, I've been there. Um, but again, I just, I don't know, like, the, it, it, was, it was a little too try-hard in, in some ways and not enough in others. Like, it was, it was going full force on the, the battery acid zoom zoom juice for coffee it was very obviously there's a character that goes by them they that has a gender neutral name dana and i'm like i appreciate the representation here but it's uh i'd almost I, I like I, I'm divided I understand like not drawing attention to it just have just normalizing it and at the same time it's just like so it felt very uh, I don't know I don't even know how to explain that <laughs> how my feelings about it it's complicated I yeah, I definitely want to normalize this stuff I don't want to have to have it be explained or whatever every time but I still did not get a good sense of this Dana character Aside from the fact that they're possibly non-binary, most likely non-binary, um, and that they have a, a partner named John, they run the bed and breakfast together. Yay, more quirky people, and you know, I I, I don't know. All of the, 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 there's this girl named Heather that was an antagonist for Florence in high school, and that, first of all, I didn't ever really feel the tension when Heather finally turns up. And then it's almost immediately, like, tossed out the window when Florence just confronts Heather and, you know, I don't know, like, it's almost like the setups and the payoffs just weren't, the stakes weren't high enough, there wasn't, there just wasn't enough here. Um, there's a lot of nice descriptions of small southern town walks in the moonlight in a graveyard and, you know, things like that, but... It's, you know, it's atmospheric, but story-wise, it was still lacking. Character development-wise, it was still lacking. So it was fine. Like I said, I gave it three stars. It wasn't like I dreaded picking it up every time I needed to <laughs> read this book. Like, it wasn't like, oh, God. You know, I would have stopped reading. But I, I mostly wanted to see if I was right about the things that I had already kind of assumed were true. Um... And, yeah, I don't know. It was fine. <laughs> um, I have a copy of, what is it? Like, every, every one of my family has killed someone or so. I have a copy of that over waiting for me. Um, I've heard good things about that one, too. So maybe, maybe that'll be more my thing. <laughs> Maybe I'm just not, I don't know if it's that the adapted fan fiction books leave me, like, feeling bleh, or if, I mean, I, I usually like romances, but you know, again, I wanted this to be a rom-com, this, this wasn't. In the same way that Book Lovers by Emily Henry, and if you haven't seen my video, nobody's seen my video on this, it's only got like three views, I don't know if it got suppressed or what. But I have the same feelings about this book as I did about Book Lovers, where the, the it's, this isn't a rom-com, this is like chick-lit romance. I mean, you get a happily ever after, yeah, but like, it's not cute. It's, I, it, it's, 
the characters are trying to be cute and quirky and fun, but the story is not cute. It's just, I don't know. Like I want, I want better banter. I want funny stuff to happen. Like not sappy. I mean, sappy, a little bit of sappy, a little bit of sweet and sentimental is fine, but this is all sweet and sentimental and sappy and not it, like almost no like actual comedy. Um, which is what I want from a book like this. I want funny things. I want, you know, yeah, more, more laugh out loud moments, I guess. Um, so if you know any books like that, let me know because that is definitely more my speed than this sort of pseudo, I'm not a chiclet reader. And this is kind of that thing that teeters on the border of. Um, and that's, I think, where, uh, or at least part of where, it loses me. So in any case, if you've read The Dead Romantics, uh, let me know uh, your thoughts. If there are other of these Raylo books, God, it seems like every time I turn around, somebody's like, oh, I read this and it's another Raylo based thing. Uh, <laughs> I'm starting to not want Raylo. Uh, in any case, <laughs> I like Raylo as a as a fan concept, I'm just not enjoying these, like, porting them into, like, mainstream fiction isn't working for me. Now, to be fair, I've only tried two. This one in Hurricane Wars, so I know there are lots more out there. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try a third and see if I get a, see if I get a consensus. Um, but yeah, let me know if you've read it. Let me know if there's other stuff that's better that I should try instead something with a little more comedy to it than uh, than you know the whatever this is <laughs> and that's it for now until next time take care